Hello, Slash. Are we getting started now? Yes, we are. It's good to be here. I think it's my sixth slush, and I can't believe how much has, uh, has changed. Uh, so congrats to everyone who's organizing. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, Europe's next wave of entrepreneurs and how we can make it better and bigger. Um, so you know, just to start, I'm Martin Mignot. I'm a partner in Xventures. We're a global uh, VC fund. We've been investing in early stage tech startups in Europe for the past 20 years. And it's been a pretty good wave uh, so far. Uh, you know, it started early in the 2000s. That's just our portfolio. Uh, with you know, MySQL, Skype, and Betfair in, in the UK. Then followed up quickly with a second wave of, of great billion dollar plus companies like King, Criteo, Just Eat, Supercell. And then you know, more recently, companies that haven't exited yet um, on, 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 on the slide. And that's just for our portfolio. Obviously, you can add a lot of companies that, unfortunately, we didn't invest in like Zalando, Klarna, Spotify, Auto One, and a lot of others. So you can see bigger waves of larger companies. Uh, so Europe has been doing well in the past 20 years. And one of the reasons is that we've solved one of the most pressing issues that we had when we got started, which was a funding issue. So you know, when we got started 20 years ago, uh, there were very few venture funds, very little money being raised. And if you look at the past four years, the amount invested in startups has more than quadrupled. Um, and, uh, and, and, and with that, the number of, of companies uh, getting funded. So the capital is not the issue anymore. So if you think about those waves and how much money is now flowing into the market, you may think that everything is going great in Europe. And yet, there is a nagging question hanging in the air, which is, where are the giants? Where are the companies that own an ecosystem, structure the ecosystem, invest in R&D, can acquire startups, and can be worth not 10 or $20 billion, like the companies on the previous slides, but hundreds of billions, or even a trillion, like Apple is soon going to be. I mean, in, in Europe, we are one or even two orders of magnitude behind the, U, the large US companies or the large Chinese companies. So we ask ourselves, why is that? And what can we do to change it? And to us, with our you know, 20 plus years of experience investing in tech companies here, it goes back to one thing, and one thing only, which is talent. And how do you get the best talent to not work for Google and Facebook and Microsoft, all the large banks, all the large consulting firms in Europe, but going to the startup scene? There are two main ways to do it. One is, I would say, the soft part which is the mission and the culture. And on that, Europe has nothing to you know, be ashamed of and, and, and can compete. And then there's a second aspect, which is the reward, the monetary reward. And when you're a startup, monetary reward, they are, you, know, you can't compete on the cash compensation. You know, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they can all beat you on the cash component. The one thing you have going for you is the options, is the upside on the equity value. And that's the area where Europe is behind and where we'd like for things to change. Um, we spent the past six months researching and looking at more than 300 companies, their cap table, more than 4,000 option grants in Europe and in the US, in our portfolio and outside of our portfolio, and try to compare and benchmark things and see why Europe was behind on that area. And so, the result of that survey, which is uh, coming out on the Index website, you can check it out, uh, Index Ventures Rewarding Talent. There's a physical book and there is, the, uh, there is also a digital version. We got four key findings. It's a long, long survey, but there's four key findings. The first one, just to quantify the scale of the issue that we've got, is that European employees at exit, on average, own half as many options as the US counterparts. So it's about 10% versus 20% on the West Coast. And not only that, but on average, again, those options are taxed twice as much as the US. So you, know, you get half and you get taxed twice as much. Obviously, it's much less attractive suddenly. And not only that, but also most of these options are skewed towards the more senior management versus non-senior execs. It's about two-thirds, one-third, while in the US, it's the other way around. And the last thing is that we have found out from, from this research is that 
the, the differences across countries, across sectors, across companies is just massive. While in the US, you have a fairly narrow range and things are very standard. You know, you get 10 or 12% in Series A and so on and so forth. In Europe, there's a really wide variation and each market operates in its own way. And we think that's not the best way to, to be competitive and to be attractive for, for talent. Um, so we are launching that research, which is uh, trying to be the ultimate guide for you entrepreneurs who are setting up your option plans on how to motivate, attract, retain your key talent, but also for policymakers to understand where do you stand. So we took a risk and uh, created a ranking of countries across Europe for the most favorable to the least favorable. I won't give any spoilers now. I think we'll discuss it a bit later on, on stage uh, in the panel. But um, that's, uh, you know, that, that's the goal, is to help entrepreneurs and policymakers to make their countries more, more attractive. And not only is there that guy that is helping you to say how much, to who, when should you give options, but we've also decided to go one step further and create a web app called, uh, in a stroke of creative genius, we call Option Plan, um, that you can go again on the index website and, and play with the tool to help you design your option plan. So I'll just give, show you a quick video to show you how it works and how it can be helpful to you. So go on our website, play with it, uh, and hopefully that will, uh, that will help you out. And just to, you know, to, to summarize, I would say our belief is that the best companies will win by being the most aggressive and the most generous with their talent, because that's a global war for talent and you have to be competitive. And secondly, is that the countries that are the most favorable to employee ownership are the ones that will be hosting the next giant of Europe and which will make it possible finally to cross the 100 billion bar and potentially the trillion bar and really build a company or multiple companies equivalent to Amazon or Facebook or Google in the US. So thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, my name is Jonathan Moles. I'm the journalist in the room. Do you want me to sit there or maybe? Uh, yeah, why don't yeah, you? Yeah. Come here, Martin. I'm, I'm the guy who's been brought on to uh, grill and stimulate uh, some discussion here on a very important subject. I'm business education correspondent at the FT as well as presenter of our Startup Stories podcast. Um, I'm thinking about the anniversaries here. It's uh, great to be back in Helsinki um, and here at the 100th anniversary of uh, independence of Finland. Um, it's actually my 18th anniversary of being at the FT and I was thinking back over the, the years and when I started I was writing about tech um, and, uh, and visiting places like Helsinki. Um, and back in those days, um, Al Gore was uh, actually thought he was going to be president um, rather than talking about uh, the current president. Um, and uh, Prince William and I had a lot more hair as well. Um, um, and, ad, and back in those days, um, Google um, uh, was a startup itself. Uh, Facebook didn't even exist. And yet now they are among the world's largest companies. And there is a question of where are those European tech titans? And I think what we're going to talk about here is whether we can, we can stimulate that. And, uh, and what we can do to build the talent, to build those world-beating companies. I'm going to start um, uh, with um, uh, Nicholas Johansson, um, 
who uh, is going to talk a bit about um, maybe how, the, how governments can help in this process and about what you, Nicholas, are doing in Sweden. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, yes, uh, and um, thank you for this presentation you've been doing. I hope that Sweden will move up the ranks. Last, last week, we, the parliament uh, passed a new law on stock options that will be uh, available from the 1st of January in Sweden. Uh, but if you look at why, from a, from a government perspective in a country like Sweden, of course, having a, our, in our whole competitiveness strategy in a country like Sweden and, and in the Nordic region, we're looking at change all the time. We're small, open economies that you need to change all, all the time. And the startup is a great driver for change, all the startups. So you really have to find ways in order to attract talent. And I can tell you, in countries like, even though countries like Sweden and Finland are maybe not the best at bragging, we do realize with the, with the November weather that attracting talent is not always the easiest thing to do. So you have to, you have to compete. Sometimes we thought that the best thing to do is to make people come here and get them hitched. Uh, then they might stay. Um, but uh, to find a partner. But so we've, we've also looked at some of the soft things because this is a behavioral model, you know. Uh, it's both risk and reward. Uh, it's about security, it's about where you want to live. It's not only how big is the benefit when you, when you hit gold, it's also how big is the risk if, if you fail, where our social security systems, our education systems help with that. Basically, you don't have to worry that your kids is not going to get a good education. If you fail, if your plans, which most uh, of our startups do sometime. Um, but one big element that we also wanted to include in Sweden is this, that we also want to compete better when it comes to stock options. So that's why we're introducing this, this new program now. And what do you have a, uh, um, an assessment of, of whether it's a success or not. What, what's, what are you going to look at and say, we've succeeded in this, in this scheme because we've seen this happen or that happen in Sweden? If you're looking at, but well, the thing is like, it's very difficult for a government point of view to sit and say like, this is the one that's gonna succeed and this and that. Mm. But if you look at the stock option program, of course, we're introducing this now. It's the first time we're doing this. It's, um, uh, and there are, of course, there are always barriers that will meet problems when you, when you do this kind of system, when it's not a general system. This is, uh, this is tax exemption, this is making it easier. We're moving taxation from the excise date to when you actually sell your shares later on. And we move it from income taxation to capital taxation. So basically there is a lot of benefit in that, but then we're not doing it broad, it's not for everybody, it's not for all the sizes of companies. So we're starting with, with smaller companies with the largest problem. And then we'll have to, to look and evaluate that. But I think there's, I hear from startups I've been meeting here that there's a lot of people who are now looking at how to use this. And, um, and uh, Stefan, if I can bring you in, uh, you, you, implement, you have implemented stock option schemes. You, you've been involved in startups that have run these. Can you tell a bit about what that actually means in practice, maybe what you do at King, and what is the effect? What's the benefit of this? Okay, so, you know, stock options is it's one tool in the toolbox. There are many other instruments uh, that you can use and, and that are relevant subject to what stage of development your company is in and also what you want to achieve. I think the, the key impact is really to make, to your employees feel and behave like owners because owners behave differently uh, because they might go the extra mile, they might be more passionate and you know, they have obviously a stake in the success of, of your company and that's very important, especially as so many of you know, tech companies and interactive entertainment for us are, are all driven by teams. So you know, it's not the individual, it's the team and, and it's a, just a reflection of the fact that the team will succeed together. The, uh, the, I think you know, government and companies and leadership have a special responsibility to make sure the equity instruments are safe and simple. 
I've seen, you know, many years ago, people going into personal bankruptcy because the equity was badly designed. And I, th and that, I think that the work that Index has done is, is, is fantastic because it's providing guidance and hopefully it's going to provide safety to entrepreneurs who don't have that experience as they build their companies. I think governments should be very mindful of what they expose potential employees to because there are very uh, serious potential implications. That's one thing. And the second thing is when we had to deploy equity plans inside King, we were you know, active in probably six or seven European ju jurisdictions. And that has meant six or, different, or seven different equity plans. So it's you know, very complex. It's very costly. If you have to take your company public later, you will have to collapse every single one of these plans into a single plan. And that's going to add to the complexity and the cost and, and the hurdle of potentially going public and creating a European champion. If you want European champions, you need to have a European system for incentive plans and equity plans. Because as long as you have fragmentation, it's going to be very hard to achieve. So you, you think maybe the bigger goal should be we should, we should have more simplicity across Europe? So. Simplicity and harmonization uh, of you know, the, uh, the taxation and the, uh, the equity structures, either for options or for RSUs, which are restricted stock units or performance stock. But it, there is an incredibly compelling case for harmonization there. Yeah. And I think I would say it's a little bit what we're trying to do here as well. Just at least get the data out there so that people can see the massive gaps that exist today between systems across Europe. So at least people can see, OK, that's the best in class. And the UK clearly is best in class. You know, Sweden coming you know, close now with the, new, with the new plan. And then trying to get everyone to, you know, to reduce the spread and get closer and closer to best in class. Rather than saying, OK, the EU needs to take that in charge and from the top down force everything, you know, just pushing from the bottom up and really trying to make sure that at least people are aware that this is an issue. That's what the situation is today, that Europe is behind, and that countries that are competing against each other and with the rest of the world need to get on board and just uh, and get closer to what best in class means. Yeah. Um, and what, what sort of effect can it have, Martin, if, if they're implemented well? Well, we believe, I mean, it's hard to quantify, obviously, but we believe that that's the single most critical thing that could happen to the ecosystem. Because basically what you would do is that you would massively shift the, the, the attractivity of the startup ecosystem versus more traditional jobs, whether in large tech company or other type of large companies. So suddenly, the, the, the talent pool available to startups would increase many fold. And that's, you know, ta Europe doesn't lack talent. I mean, we've got great universities, we've got you know, really well-educated people, but they don't work in the right places. You know, they should be come, you know, work in, uh, in, in, in the tech ecosystem. And that's what we're lacking. Is is there an issue, though, we're focusing on stock options, and there are many other things that stimulate people, and, and I think Stefan and, and Nicholas sort of pointed that. It's, uh, you know, people, people are human, they have families and other things that they, they want to, uh, to know that their, their company is, is nurturing that bigger self. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the cultural element of it, and, and obviously startups are not for everyone, clearly. You know, it, it can be you know, hard work, intense, you know, insecure, you know, it, it's, not, it's not an easy environment, but at the same time, today the issue is, is, is exactly that, is that the imbalance between risk and reward is just totally, you know, is, is skewed. Because the risk is high, so the reward needs to be high as well. And today you don't have that high reward, because it's too complex to operate these option plans, as you know, Stefan mentioned. Yeah. And whenever, even if you hit gold, as you would say, and by a you know, company going public, then you're going to be very heavily taxed and you wouldn't have had enough options in the first place to really make a difference. So yeah. you know, I think those are all of these elements to, get, you know, to keep in mind and rebalancing the risk-reward ratio in Europe. Yeah, Nicholas? Yeah, I think that it's very important to not look only at elements like stock options that we really have to broaden the view. If we're discussing attracting talent, of course, one of the most important things which I think that a day like today is evidence of is like bringing people together from all over the world attracting talent from all over the, the openness, not building walls. Um, that's extremely important uh, to get that. But also when it comes to when we are looking at how should we attract more talent, we are looking more at Sweden is very good. We can't be best at everything, but we're good at some of these soft things. And I do believe that we are especially good when it comes towards uh, 
talented women. I think they like Sweden. Uh, that's, uh, so that's one area where we are I, thinking of target, uh, a target market. I, I was going to mention this point, Nicholas. There are four men here talking about yeah. the importance of diversity of talent for white men. Um, uh, and, and people are motivated by different factors. I mean, on that, on that gender element, is there anything you can offer on, on what we can do to, to, you know, gain from both sexes? Definitely. When it comes to, I think, policy-wise, uh, there are many, many things you can do to, to improve equality. And basically, it's about giving women career opportunities and not having men and women have to, sh to choose between a career and family. The things we can do to combine this means a more equal society. We've come quite a way in, in, in the Nordic countries, even though we have very long still to go. But things like that, I, have, I told you backstage about this good, good vision of, of this picture of uh, or story of an American being in Stockholm, seeing all these men walking around with strollies and saying that, oh, why are there so many male nannies in Sweden? Uh, they weren't nannies, they were on paternity leave, yeah. which is, these are elements that, that one should put into this equation, I think. Yeah. It, it's a country where you want to bring up your kids, where both, where both can work. And, and it's not just gender. In, uh, Stefan, in, in, in your company, you have different types of people. There, presumably, there, there are people who are going to take risks because of a financial reward, but actually encouraging people to take risks, other people are, are stimulated by other things. Can, what, what do you do, and, and can you explain a bit about the different people in King that you're Sure. I, think, I mean, the, the majority of people, you know, the, their main driver is not the financial reward. You know, the... That it's an unnecessary uh, condition, you know, to add to a, you know, a, a very compelling mission, uh, you know, a great culture, and and uh, and a great working environment. But you know, to to build on on you know the, the point that Tiklas was making, diversity and inclusion is obviously a, a dominant theme in the workplace today. And you know, it's not only a, um, about you know making. Uh, your the, the work environment more diverse it's also retaining the diversity and 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 nurturing the inclusiveness once you have a diverse workforce and in addition to that is to make the the workplace safe i think the issues we're seeing right now with the me too movement is even if you achieve a high ratio of diversity and you strive for inclusiveness you still have many safety issues in the workplace which are bubbling up you know first in venture capital then in technology then in, you know, in the political circles right now in the UK. And, and it's, it's very complex because if something happens during the weekend and then, on mo you know, it's not your problem. But as of Monday morning at 9 a.m., if the, the workplace is no longer safe and there is awkwardness, it becomes my problem. And, you know, we are now spending a, a, a lot of time thinking very hard on how we can make our place, our workplace safer, how... Uh, you know, we can provide, you know, a very confidential environment where there's no fear of retaliation, where, you know, the channels are open, the confidentiality is respected. And I think that's, that's going to be a very big theme for, for the years to come mm. uh, in, you know, our industry and in the tech industry in general. And Martin, your, um, your point about uh, the need for talent to, to come through and, and uh, wanting more of this sort of risk-taking among people, people getting involved in entrepreneurial ventures. What, what sort of people are you thinking of here that we can, that are being missed at the moment and not drawn into this and how we can draw them in? I think it's, it's across worlds. Uh, obviously, there's the tech side, but there's also everything else, which is you know, marketing, comms, PR, finance, ops. There's a very wide range of roles in startups. It's not all about you know, coders and developers. You know, there's, there's a very, you know, and that's why you need diverse skill set and people who have been working I don't know, in the hotel industry would be fantastic for working for Airbnb, for example. Uh, so, you know that, and so I think that is, we need a lot more of that as well, of kind of this cross-pollinization between you know, traditional sectors and the tech sectors. I think you know, until we open up the floodgates, then we won't have enough, enough talent and, and the right talent to come work for, this, uh, for the tech companies. Yeah. And 
you, you're advising a lot of companies as well as companies you're investing in. Um, and, you know, and there are some really big success stories there. You know, Deliveroo, um, you know, has, has unicorn status, you know, $2 billion valuation now. Um, what do you think those sort of companies are doing to, to, to motivate people within them, above and beyond stock options? Yeah, so I mean, look, stock option is, is clearly one. I think we were always, and, I, and I'm calling for all of our fellow investors to do the same, which is to push the entrepreneurs to not think short term only about the dilution, but think long term about getting the best people on board and thinking, you know, if you want to build a 10, 20, 30 or plus billion dollar company, it's going to require a lot of you know, senior people, experienced people, and that's going to have a cost for you. And you should get prepared to dilute yourself to get these people on board. Um, and then I would say, you know, in, in the liberal case, I guess you know, the, the culture is, you know, is, is, is critical. Uh, you know, they just moved, for example, into a new office. And you know, office space sounds like something, you know, logistical. But actually, you know, for the first time, you know, they always, you know, they grew very fast. They were always in like, this very crammed space with, you know, rats and mice. I mean, it was, it was quite disgusting for a long time. And for the first time, they moved into a proper office, I would say, for the right size, for the right, you know, team. And that's made a massive impact into the kind of people they've been able to attract and retain as well. Uh, and I think just having something as simple as the work environment is huge. Um, but I do think you need, you, need, you, need, you, know, you need both. You need the soft stuff that we've discussed, but you also need the hard stuff. And yeah. I think a lot of people are staying at, at Deliveroo as well because they think their options that were issued four or five years ago in the EMI scheme with very low strike price are now worth you know, millions. Um, and you see companies like Criteo, for example, when they went public, everyone had options in the company, and they made in, you know, instantaneously more than 50 millionaires, and, and then the company you know, still grew and, 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 and increased in value, so probably more than, more than 100. You know, and, and all of these people, you know, it's only about the, them becoming rich, that's great, but most of them are now starting new company, investing in new companies, and so it's not only about Criteo, it's about the ecosystem that goes around it. And you see, you know, we just reinvested in the you know, Criteo CEO new, new business. And he's obviously reinvesting a lot himself because he's, you know, he's made money from the Criteo story. And that's exactly the kind of snowball effect that we really want to get started. And that's, that's why options are not only about today and the company today, but also about growing the pie for tomorrow. Martin. Uh, I think we could carry on this debate, but I realize our time is up on the screen. Um, it feels like that there's, there's, there's movement here in Europe. Maybe we're on the cusp of something in countries like Sweden. We can do things, but it's a lot more than money. It it's is. less than... And right. A good office helps. <laughs> exactly. Um, can we just thank the uh, panelists here? And um, we're on to the next act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.